All right. Next question is from Kyle. It says, you recommend a 30-year mortgage so that someone can afford more house and have a lower payment, allowing you to save and invest more per month. Here's the spicy part. Why isn't that the same for buying a car? Mm. Mm, Because you guys teach 23.8 as the rule for buying the cars. So what do you have to say? Our audience tries to catch us. Yeah, so I'm going to go very quickly. Ruby just referenced something. Uh, We believe that when it comes to buying a car, you got to subscribe to 23.8. We want you to put 20% down. You cannot finance for any more than three years. And all of your car payments cannot exceed 8% of your gross income. That is like our hard and fast rule when it comes to borrowing money to go out and buy a car. But we've also said, hey, 15-year versus 30-year mortgages, you should look at 30-year mortgages because what it would allow you to do is in this housing market where prices have run up and interest rates are high, it will give you a higher likelihood in getting into a house that makes more sense for you. So why are these two things not equivalent? Well, I think, Brian, there are really two reasons that I think we should unpack here. Uh, The first one's that I think I'm going to say that this is the easy one. The very first reason I think about uh, is that cars are depreciable assets. They get less valuable to t- through time. So the more you extend your payment, the longer you're paying for an asset that's getting less and less and less valuable. Houses are different. They appreciate. And whether you have a 15-year mortgage or a 30-year mortgage, the house is still going to increase at the same pace. It's going to increase at the same value. So you can't compare an appreciable asset to a depreciable asset. Here's where I think uh, things get a little bit, little bit wonky. Because just like we have our car buying rule, Brian, we also have some home buying rules. And it is, I'm going to say, a little bit more difficult for someone's eyes to get bigger than their wallet when it comes to a house. That's not the reason why I put that in there. But when it comes to a car, boy, don't we see this happen all the time time. Yeah, it's a, it's got a lot of ego pride to it. I know people get mad when I talk about this stuff um, because it, it's not uncommon. Even successful people, what is the first thing that when we talk to doctors, when people come out of their residency, they, they get that first big paycheck and they all run out and reward themselves mm-hmm. with the fancy cars. That should not be the first step in your wealth building journey is how cool can I look to my friends, neighbors, and people who just literally don't care what car you drive. But in your mind, we all build it up. And I think also the commercials make it seem that way too. I mean, I, I even, I was doing, I was doing content recently on Corvettes, you know, talking about the the, the false reality that's created out there. If you go and uh, I went on and, and looked at Corvette commercials, everybody who was in the commercials was young, attractive, and looked like they were having the best life. And then you go a- actually look at the reality of the situation and you find out that Corvette owners are usually in their low early 60s and it's men. Longer than the no, there were zero 60-something-year-old men in the video that I watched. So I'm like, what is, what's going on here? So let's bring it back to the two things. I'm trying to encourage and create access to buying your first house because that is a wealth builder. There's a, if you even look at the most recent stats that came from the Federal Reserve, unfortunately for Americans, the only place that they're building wealth is actually in the equity mm-hmm. in their houses. So there's actually history, there's precedent that owning your own house and building equity in it, equity in it can actually be a, a, a win to your back on your wealth building process. Compare and contrast that to your car, <laughs> which is strictly a consumption decision. It is actually napalm to the wealth building process because cars depreciate um, instantly when you drive them off, we're getting back to the norm where you, you know cars in the first three to four years will lose 50% of their value. So I'm trying to minimize your appetite on the car you drive as much as possible because you need to, yes, you need reliable transportation to get to your job, which is going to be the first ingredient to your wealth building process, but you don't need to look super cool in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why it, fancy cars don't happen until step Eight yep. of the financial order of operations, prepaid future expenses, or what we like to call abundance goals. That's when you can do the fancier cars, and it's it's one of those things when you're in the early part of twenty three eight. I want you to be thinking Tercel or Corolla 
or, or you know some uh, uh, you know a Honda Civic, Honda Accord, uh, a Camry, something like that. Mm-hmm. Not the you know if we're staying on the family of Toyotas, not the Land Cruiser, mm-hmm. because that's where I think people will sometimes get themselves minimize your expectations because cars are wealth napalm. Equity and home ownership is actually a wealth builder. And we've actually come through a market where it's getting harder and harder. So that's why our rules give you a lot more grace on the first time home purchase because we're just trying to get you on the train. And that's not the easiest thing when we just came through inflation as well as runaway home prices as well as high interest rates. It's kind of working against you. So we've had to create or, or just highlight the rules that give you additional grace and flexibility to actually get on that wealth building journey. I love it.